today on Truths That Transform. Thankfulness, of course, is simply the outward expression of an inward attitude of gratitude. And that certainly is a reflection of the goodness and grace and mercy of God. The Puritans cared very much about civil liberties and, of course, were very righteous in their understanding of uh, God's design of the world. Religious liberty is a great privilege that goes back to the founding of our nation, and we need to be bold to defend it. Because liberty is so precious in America, we want you to have a copy of Freedom's Holy Light with a firm reliance on divine providence by Dr. Peter Lilback. You'll discover the role of God and His providence in the founding of America. We'll send it at no cost or obligation to you. Just call or write to us today and ask for Freedom's Holy Light. This booklet will help you trace the hand of God as the source of our liberty throughout the history of America. Welcome to Truths That Transform, a production of D. James Kennedy Ministries. There are all sorts of ways to connect with us, so make sure to find us on YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, and on the web at djkm.org. During this month of Thanksgiving, we are reminded that we have so much to be thankful for, even in trying times. We live in a free nation where we have the opportunity to choose our own leaders and where our God-given rights are acknowledged and protected by a constitution. What you may not know is just how rare a thing that is in human history. Many are trying to erase our history, but if we lose touch with our history, we lose touch with the very foundation of our freedom. That's why our Providence Forum Outreach and its executive director, Jerry Newcomb, have produced the Foundation of American Liberty series of documentaries. Did you know that when the settlers from England came here in the 1600s, the pilgrims and Puritans who arrived carried with them the seeds of our constitutional republic? Discover how as we begin with a preview of the newest installment of this series, A City on a Hill. On April 7, 1630, a fleet of ships carrying about 1,000 British men, women, and children began a three-month voyage to the New World. They would soon arrive in what is now Boston, Massachusetts, the city they created. They were the Puritans. Their leader was the Reverend John Winthrop, whom noted historian Paul Johnson has dubbed the first great American. Aboard the ship Arabella, Winthrop preached a sermon to his followers called A Model of Christian Charity. His voice carried so that those in all of the ships could hear him. We shall find that the God of Israel is among us, and ten of us shall be able to resist a thousand of our enemies. The Lord will make our name a praise and glory, so that men shall say of succeeding plantations, the Lord make it like that of New England, for we must consider that we shall be like a city upon a hill. The eyes of all people are on us. John Winthrop. The city upon a hill reference of Reverend John Winthrop, who is quoting Jesus, was a favorite phrase of Ronald Reagan. In 1989, in his last radio address, outgoing President Ronald Reagan referenced it. The hope of human freedom, the quest for it, the achievement of it, is the American saga. And I've often recalled one group of early settlers making a treacherous crossing of the Atlantic on a small ship when their leader, a minister, noted that perhaps their venture would fail and they would become a byword a footnote to history. But perhaps too, with God's help, they might also found a new world, a city upon a hill, a light unto the nations.
Reverend John Winthrop's settlement of Boston in 1630 was the first major wave of Puritans to come to America. The Puritans held the first secret ballots in America to elect their minister. Even the term election was used by the Puritans because they believed in the Calvinist doctrine of election, that some were chosen by God to be saved. When an election was held, the question was, which of these candidates seems to exhibit the characteristics of someone who is elect? Furthermore, the Puritans implemented the practice of having election day sermons. An election day sermon is that on the day of the election, they would have the minister, they would choose a minister in a local community or in a colony to actually give a sermon about the morality and character of the men that should be elected that day or women elected to office. And they did this uh, in America throughout the colonial era and really caused the electorate to think morally and spiritually that their vote counted, that they were making a decision that would determine their freedom. The devout men and women who settled New England, the Pilgrims and then the Puritans, saw themselves as being on an errand into the wilderness, according to Reverend Cotton Mather, who lived from 1663 until 1728. Cotton Mather was a prolific Puritan divine from whom we learn so much about their settlements. Mather, who graduated from Harvard in 1678 when he was 15, wrote hundreds of books, including a large two-volume set, Magnalia Christi Americana, or The Great Works of Christ in America. It was first published in 1702, and it provides an early account of so much from that era, including his pious ancestors. Wherever they sat down, they were so mindful of their errand into the wilderness that still one of their first works was to gather a church into the covenant and order of the gospel. Cotton Mather. This was not an easy errand. The shores were inhospitable, as were the winters, which proved so fatal at first. The Indians were hostile. Many things were going against the Puritans. Nonetheless, they viewed their efforts as being blessed by God. Speaking of New England at large, Cotton Mather would declare, Never was any plantation brought under such a considerableness in a space of time so inconsiderable. An howling wilderness in a few years became a pleasant land, accommodated with the necessaries, yea, and the conveniences of humane life. The gospel has carried with it a fullness of all other blessings. Cotton Mather. Although initially the Puritans were technically members of the Church of England, which has a rule by bishops model, in America they chose to adopt the congregational model, the one practiced by the pilgrims. This model stressed self-government for each congregation. They would vote in their own pastors. In a sense, the clergy were the first elected officials of the new American society. A society which, to that extent, had a democratic element from the start. Paul Johnson. Boston flourished as a town the Puritans built from scratch. The dispensations of the gospel were never enjoyed by any town with more liberty and purity for so long a while together. Cotton Mather. Mather pointed out that Boston had been threatened many times, so the city officials called for days of fasting and prayer. They called on God to spare them from multiple fires, from a potential French invasion, and from outbreaks of smallpox. They repeatedly saw answers to their prayers. And what was the practical impact of personal piety on Boston in that era? A 17th century traveler from London said, I have lived in a country where in seven years I never saw a beggar, nor heard an oath, a cuss word, nor looked upon a drunkard. He was talking about Boston. It may be there never was any region under heaven happier than poor New England hath been in magistrates, whose true piety was worthy to be made the example of after ages. Cotton Mather. The Puritans were dedicated to the rule of law, 
so they commissioned a minister who had legal training to assemble together principles of the Bible that would spell out civil liberties that the colonists could implement. Reverend Nathaniel Ward thus created in 1641 the Massachusetts Body of Liberties. The Puritans cared very much about civil liberties and of course were very righteous in their understanding of uh, God's design of the world. Civil liberties spelled out in the Massachusetts Body of Liberties included due process and avoiding double jeopardy. John Winthrop, the key Puritan leader in Boston, was a strong leader, and in some cases he was accused of being too strong. But some historians, like Paul Johnson, author of A History of the American People, note that Winthrop had to be strong to build up everything from scratch. In only a few decades, Reverend John Winthrop had overall succeeded in creating a settlement based on the Bible. The city on a hill was becoming established. That city on a hill founded in New England nearly 400 years ago has become the longest standing constitutional republic in the world. Many modern progressives want to paint these settlers as genocidal maniacs bent on destruction. Nothing could be farther from the truth. The true history is being hidden from your children and grandchildren. The truth, as you have seen, is much different and it's the crucial basis for our freedom. You've just seen a short portion of a city on a hill from our Providence Forum outreach, but we would be delighted to send you the entire program on DVD as our thanks for your generous donation to the ongoing work of this ministry. Simply contact us using the information you see on the screen. Those who settled this country established the first Thanksgiving. Despite the incredible difficulties they faced in the new world, which included the deaths of many who made the journey, these courageous Christian men and women set aside a time to thank God, which we still do every year in November. That's because gratitude lies at the very center of the Christian life. Here's Dr. D. James Kennedy to shed more light. I think if we're going to realize the importance of thankfulness and thanksgiving, we need to remember that in the first chapter of the book of Romans, which is the most extensive statement of the Christian gospel message, after declaring that God is the creator of all things and such is known by the creation, that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God. And then as they began that great decline into the miry pit of sin, they state, Paul states, neither were they thankful. And that was the beginning of the slippery slope that led to hell. Neither were they thankful. You know, the, the man that is really thankful for his wife doesn't commit adultery. The person who's thankful for what he has doesn't steal what he has not. If we're really thankful, it will truly transform our lives. I made some discovery in, in preparing this in uh, looking up the word for thankful or be ye thankful or neither were they thankful. The word is a, a familiar one. Uh, we have a, an English word that comes right from eucharisteo. We get the word eucharist, which is one of the names for the Lord's Supper, which means uh, to be thankful. But that comes from two parts, eu, which means good, and charis, which means grace, good grace. And a definition given by one of the authorities is this, quote, the divine influence upon the heart and its reflection in the life. So that thankfulness is a reflection of the good grace of God to us in so very many ways. Now, too often, I think, because we don't have everything that we would like, 
and because things are not just perfect, we can't see the ointment for the fly. When we first came here, we built a home, which was the first home that we had ever built, and uh, it was a very palatial mansion, cost $19,000. 19,300, I think, to be exact. And, uh, but to us, it was our first home together, and it was absolutely perfect. At least until one day when I was sitting out on the patio on my day off, I looked up at the overhang, and there was a crack. <laughs> and all I could see was the crack, and I had become very, very ungrateful. And finally, I was awakened to my uh, condition and confessed it and repented of it and thanked the Lord for the part for all of the house, including the crack, which had taught me a very, very important lesson. And that is that we need to be grateful even in an imperfect world. And many people are, are going to be grateful just as soon as everything is perfect just as soon as they can get rid of all of the problems, all of the aches and pains, and just as soon as you can get your spouse straightened out so that he or she is perfect, then you're really gonna be grateful. Well, friend, you're never gonna be grateful. I think of a woman who was elderly, bedridden, ill, and poor. And a lady visited her in her little, tiny, one-room apartment, and she came in, and. Everything was so run down and pitiful. She sat on the edge of the, of the bed, and the woman uh, smiled up at her when she saw her, and she said, oh, I'm so happy to see you. I was just lying here giving thanks to God. And the woman looked around at this miserably scant, and sparse room which had walls with cracks in them that you could see outside. And she said to her, how can you possibly be thankful for anything? Look at this place. Well, you can see outside right through the cracks. She said, that's exactly what I was doing. I was thanking God for the sunshine that I could see coming through the cracks in the walls. Wow, does that rebuke my ingratitude. Thankfulness, of course, is simply the outward expression of an inward attitude of gratitude. And that certainly is a reflection of the goodness and grace and mercy of God. You know, over these 30-some years, I've had many people come in to me for counseling, and some of them have said to me, and now, Pastor, I don't want to shock you, but, ah, I want to tell you, there is nothing anybody could say to me that would shock me. I have heard it all many times over, and they have told me about their egregious and heinous sins that they have committed. But I'll tell you, there is, there is one, one sin I think that would shock me. If someone ever came into me and said, Pastor, I don't want to shock you, but, but I have committed this horrible, heinous, terrible, ghastly, wicked sin. I have been ungrateful. Now that would shock me. I have never once heard any person confess that sin to me. Have you? And yet the Bible condemns it as a seminal sin one that leads down into the very depths of depravity. And so God commands us to be thankful. And if we are the recipients of his grace, then our eyes should be open to see the goodness of his hand all around us. And how often do I, and no doubt many of you, fail to express our thankfulness to the people who bless our lives in so many ways. And gratitude acknowledges our dependence upon one another. We're all dependent upon so many people. And I hope that, that as we're reminded each year of the importance of thankfulness, that God will enable us to be thankful 
to be thankful for our families and to express it. You know, there are many people that desperately need to hear that. I think of a woman who had lost her husband and life had lost all of its meaning for her and she didn't see any reason to, to live anymore. And someone said to her one day, you know, I am thankful to God for you. It transformed her life. Somebody appreciates me. Somebody needs me. My life has a meaning and a purpose again. Thanksgiving can not only be a tonic, which can indeed bring new life and joy to our own hearts, it can change the lives of those that we express it to as well. My daughter gave me a big hug this morning and said to me, I'm thankful to God for you. And you know, it's amazing what those words will do for an old dad's heart and for anybody's heart as well. And if you haven't been expressing the gratitude that you ought to be, I hope that out of that attitude of gratitude, which is a reflection of the grace and goodness of God, that if we are going to demonstrate ourselves to be the children of God, of the infinitely gracious God, then we cannot be thankless and Christian at the same time. Be ye thankful. Hi, I'm Jennifer Kennedy Cassidy, and I am so grateful for my dad and the legacy left, not only to me, but to all of us. He understood that gratitude to God is the very essence of the Christian life. He was also an avid student of history and knew that our forefathers in America believed the very same thing. Even through extreme difficulty in the new world, they declared a day of feasting and giving thanks to God for his blessings. We still celebrate Thanksgiving to this very day, though many have forgotten whom we're thanking. In a day when historical figures are being canceled and our nation's story is being rewritten by radicals, discover the truth about who we are in the compelling new documentary, A City on a Hill, from Providence Forum's Foundation of American Liberty series. This DVD is produced by Dr. Jerry Newcomb, and you saw a portion of it earlier in this program. The enemies of Christian faith try to tear down our nation's founding, but this new DVD brings you the true story of the brave men and women who came to America for the glory of God and the advancement of the Christian religion. And discover how they sought to build that shining city on a hill, a phrase that continues down even through the era of Ronald Reagan and beyond. We'll send you this DVD documentary, A City on a Hill, as our thanks for your generous donation to help this ministry proclaim truth defend America's true history, and broadcast the transforming news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And if you're able to give a donation of $60 or more, we'll send you the City on a Hill DVD, plus the fascinating hardcover book, Rediscovering America, How the National Holidays Tell an Amazing Story About Who We Are, by Scott Powell. In this groundbreaking book, Scott gives the untold and forgotten story of the greatness and utter uniqueness of America presented through the lens of our national holidays. Scott Powell traces their history and shows how they fit together and display the best of America and the liberty we enjoy. What could be more appropriate during this month when we have a national holiday where we, as a nation, stop to give thanks to Almighty God? Eric Metaxas says, Rediscovering America is not only genuinely entertaining to read, it is also deeply important. We'll send this hardcover book to you along with the DVD documentary, A City on a Hill, produced by Jerry Newcomb and Providence Forum as our thanks for your generous donation of $60 or more. And we'll send the DVD to you as our thanks for any generous donation. Simply write to us at D. James Kennedy Ministries, Box 11154, Fort Lauderdale, Florida, 33339. Or call toll-free 877-962-7677. Or go online to djkm.org. Thanksgiving is profoundly countercultural. 
That might sound like a strange statement to make. After all, the entire nation will shut down for a day later this month, and hundreds of millions of people will gather around the table to eat turkey and dressing and watch football. So how can it be countercultural? In a culture that has largely forgotten God, the goal of life is to pursue our own personal satisfaction at the expense of all else and to accumulate as much wealth for yourself as possible for the sole purpose of meeting your own needs and desires. Our schools have taught generations of children that they are the blind products of time, chance, and matter. In such a world, who is there to thank? And why would we bother? Our culture has turned its heart away from true thanksgiving, but the biblical psalmist knew better. Praise the Lord. I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart and the company of the upright in the congregation. Great are the works of the Lord, studied by all who delighted them, full of splendor and majesty in his work, and his righteousness endures forever. Why is this so important that the Bible emphasizes it over and over again? The giving of thanks and praise to God is literally what we were created for. And in God's design, we ultimately find joy and satisfaction there. In the famous words of the smaller catechism of the Westminster Confession of Faith, man's chief end or purpose is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. Giving thanks is not some add-on to the Christian life. It lies at its very heart. And the Bible tells us that remembering is the key to thanksgiving, regardless of our circumstances. We will never grow in this area if we forget God's blessing. Throughout the Bible, God's people went through seasons of forgetfulness and seasons of remembrance. When they forgot the blessings of God, it led to grumbling, fear, and anger. But remembering led to thanksgiving, peace, and joy. The pilgrims at Plymouth Rock, who lost more than half of their number over the first winter in America, could have easily lost hope. Instead, they gave thanks to God through the difficulty and found peace and great blessing. So it's my prayer that we too remember God's promises and blessings this Thanksgiving season. It's what we were created to do. I'm Pastor Rob Pacienza. I want to personally invite you to join us at Coral Ridge Presbyterian Church if you're ever in Fort Lauderdale or anytime by live stream at crpc.tv. There you can also find past live streams and all sorts of other resources. Thank you for tuning in. And here's a look at the next Truths That Transform. The Puritans were critical to the rise of covenantalism and to republicanism and to American freedom at large. That's next week. This has been a production of D. James Kennedy Ministries.